Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Justin Conrad. I'm the director of the Center for International Trade and Security here at UGA. Uh, I'd like to welcome you this morning. We appreciate you being here with us. Uh, our talk this morning is part of our Global Decision Series, which examines pressing issues in national and international security. And uh, we, are, uh, we have a great speaker for today who has a wealth of knowledge and experience uh, in international security issues. Um, and, but before we get started with the talk, I uh, just wanted to give you a, a couple of reminders about the format of our talk today. So we are using a webinar format which means that we cannot see or hear the audience members. Um, however, we very much encourage uh, questions for our speaker. Um, we'll have a Q&A session at the end uh, after she's done speaking. And uh, so the way that you can communicate your questions to her uh, is in the Q&A box, which you should be able to find at the bottom of your screen. Um, just click on that Q&A bubble uh, and just type in your questions directly. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and read, uh, select a few of those and read those at the end of the talk. Um, and you can type those in whenever you want. Uh, as she's speaking, if you think of a question, I would encourage you just to go ahead and uh, enter that in the chat box there in the Q&A box. So uh, let me actually introduce our speaker for this morning um, uh, or, afternoon in her case. Uh, she's coming to us live from Brussels. We are very grateful to have Dr. Benedetta Berti with us, uh, who is uh, going to discuss the future of human security. Dr. Berti is currently the head of policy planning in the office of the Secretary General of NATO. Uh, she's also an Eisenhower Global Fellow and a TED Senior Fellow. Uh, and she served in a number of research and teaching roles uh, at various institutes, including at the Institute for European Studies, the Institute for National Security, as well as the United States Military Academy at West Point. You've probably seen Dr. Birdie at some point in the news because uh, she is uh, regularly a commentator on international security, political violence, Middle Eastern politics, uh, at places like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and Al Jazeera, among others. She's also the author or editor of four books, including Armed Political Organizations from Conflict to Integration. And her most recent book is The End of Terrorism, Beyond ISIS and the State of Emergency. Uh, I also want to add that although Dr. Birdie is clearly a very distinguished speaker, um, she is arguably the most distinguished speaker that we have ever had uh, at SITS uh, because she, this is a first for us. She's the first speaker that we've had uh, that was awarded knighthood. In 2015, the government of Italy awarded her the Order of the Star of Italy. So needless to say, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Birdie with us today. Uh, welcome, Dr. Birdie. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. And I cannot, uh, I cannot thank you enough for the really kind uh, introduction. And uh, yes, the, the idea of knighthood is very European, I imagine. So uh, I'll leave you with that. But um, let me go straight into, into the topic of, of the, the brief lecture I will be giving today which uh, as you know, is the future of human security. So what I would like to do uh, over the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes is really make a case, make a case for why this concept, which I'm going to, to talk about today, the concept of human security and the focus on how we, uh, how civilians, allow, uh, how ordinary people experience conflict, I'm going to try to make the case why, uh, of what, uh, as a, why this is a neglected and really important dimension of security and ultimately my my policy point is that we would all be better off as countries our societies and, and as defense communities if we uh, ultimately expanded and took a broader look at how at security and really integrated this human security dimension um, 
So that's a little bit my, my agenda for the day. And of course, I'm here speaking in a personal capacity and not in an official one and building on, uh, on the over a decade of research that I have, um, that I've built looking at how civilians experience conflict and how we can use that, um, that insight to really help uh, build more resilient uh, communities in the face of armed hostilities. So I'll start. So what I want to do today really is first talk about what you what human security means and then go into uh, why I believe that that is a really important dimension of uh, how we should look at conflict and then give you a few examples as to why uh, by taking a broader and more integrated perspective to what security means we can ultimately make uh, better policy choices. So that's the talk in a nutshell. And uh, to start, uh, let's start at the beginning. And I think the beginning is uh, that uh, the beginning is that hum what is human security? But and and only to understand what is human security, I guess we can start with the major question, which is what does it act? What is security, and what do we mean by it? Um, it may seem like a trivial question, but I don't think it is. Uh, the word itself is loaded with meaning, meaning that different cultures, different societies at different times and different places do assign a different meaning to the word security. In that sense, we can say it is an elusive word, a word that is inherently difficult uh, to define. And I think we can all agree on one simple fact, and that is that security is something very basic. It is a basic political good, and it is a basic political good that both individuals, communities, societies, and countries all need uh, to have, uh, to then have uh, additional development, political, uh, political reform, stability. It all builds upon having a minimum level of security. So it is incredibly important to the point that traditional uh, political science has always looked at the ability to provide security as the quintessential definition of what makes a state a state, the Leviathan, the social contract. It's all about being able to provide security. But that said, I would argue that a healthy democratic society needs to have regular conversations about what security means and what does it actually what does it take to make us secure? Because of course that is about prioritization. It's about prioritizing. And I would argue that it's especially important today because in a changing security environment, in a changing world, the concept of security threats is itself changing. Only two decades ago, when we use the word security and security threats, really we, we would immediately and predominantly think about um, military threats. And of course, military threats are there and they've not gone away and they're still very important. But today, and we have a lot of data for this from recent polls asking ordinary citizens in our countries from what from North America to Europe, what what do you feel is the major threat to your security? And the answers are more and more non-military, from climate change to pandemics, of course. And therefore, the, the concept of security is changing, is broadening, and we need to, uh, to adapt in the defense and security sector. And that's when the issue, and that's where the idea of human security can really help us. It can help us to expand what we mean by security. It can help us think of security in terms of what are the trades of that we need, need to have in a society to have security. Because of course, uh, all political goods are, you need to think about it in terms of trades of. What do you? What are you willing to sacrifice in order to be more, more secure? And of course, uh, there has to be a healthy medium between things you give up and things you gain. Uh, but at the same time, th talking about human security is important because it can help us, I think, clarify and dispel some myth or some false trade-off. For example, and that's one of the points I'll, I'll make in the next few minutes, uh, I think in the past 20 years, we've often talked about uh, security as a tr as in terms of a trade-off with rights. 
security versus human rights, security versus civil liberties. And I think when we talk about human security, we, uh, we are able to say that actually this, this is a false dichotomy. There is a false opposition. It is actually uh, security and, and human rights. One of the best way to ensure stability and peace and security is ultimately to also invest in rights and freedoms. So in other words, it helps us to not look at false, at uh, problematizing what are false dichotomies. So, what is human security that I'm talking about, and I'm uh, and I'm singing the praises of this concept? It is simply a uh, way to look at security in a broader way. The definition itself is fairly old; is from 1994 from the United Nations, and really the the powerful but very simple insight here is that. Um, Traditionally, when we when we say security, especially when we think of security and defense, what we're really talking about is the security of the state. So what we're thinking about is um, national security, which means the security of the state. It means protecting our sovereignty, protecting our territorial integrity, mostly protecting us as countries from external threats and mostly thinking about threats in military terms and thinking at solutions also in military terms. Because of course, if you're facing external military threats to defend yourself, you also need military tools. Now, I am not saying that this vision or this idea of security is wrong. It is absolutely um, necessary. The point I would make is that in our complex security environment, the problem is that just looking at national security is simply not sufficient. It is necessary, but it is not sufficient. And it leads, and sometimes it can lead us into just thinking about something that in political science we call negative peace. Negative peace simply means the absence of war. And of course, that is something we need. But in order to build more sustainable peace, positive peace. We just, we don't, we need more than the absence of conflict. We also need development. We also need political freedoms. And we also need uh, a broader set of, uh, a broader definition of security. Uh, another problem with looking at security only through the lens of the states is that, of course, in democratic states, uh, the government is the representative of, is the elected representative of the people, and therefore, um, talking about state security and people security is more aligned. But in many authoritarian states, think of China, think of Russia, uh, thinking of security only through the lens of the state can easily be abused by framing all types of protests or all types of, of all types of protests to the state as security threats. And that is definitely something that I think in the long term is detrimental to the concept of security. So if we all agree that, of course, national security is key and it is necessary, uh, then the, the other point is, but it is not sufficient, and that's why we need to also think about security in terms of the, what makes people, societies, and communities secure. And that's where human security uh, comes in. And it basically talks about two main dimensions of security, freedom from fear and freedom from want. Freedom from fear is closer to a national security concept. It basically means when we think about security, first and foremost, we have to look at uh, ensuring that people, individuals, communities, and societies can live their life free from fear. But that's not just free from external military threats, that's also thinking about crimes, but also thinking uh, freedom from intimidation or repression. So it is a broader set of challenges. But, and that's the additional layer of human security, uh, free, freedom from fear alone, it's not enough to guarantee stability. We also have to think about freedom from want. And that basically very simply means that it is unrealistic to expect stability or peace in the absence of a minimum level of economic security, food security, health security, and environmental security. In other words, uh, we cannot think of societies as being at peace or being secure if in, if communities and societies and individuals are not able to live 
uh, to enjoy a minimum level of dignity and to live free from poverty and despair. So in that sense, we, we through the lens of human security, we're really looking at what does it take to build peace? What does it take to build stability? And the, 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 the simple but very difficult to implement idea is that you need both. You need freedom from fear, but you also need the freedom from want. And when you only focus on look at threats through one lens, you risk, uh, you risk implementing solutions that in the longer term may not work. And I would like to give you a few examples uh, as to why broadening the lens through which we look at security is not just something that is important in academia, it's not just important for at an intellectual level, it is also really important in practice because it can lead us to better assessments, so it can lead us to better understand reality and ultimately to make better choices uh, when it comes to policies. So it is not just in academic conversation here. Um, first of all, I think that there is a very, there is a very concrete advantage to looking at security through a broader lens, and that is where it allows us to see the context more clearly and ultimately to be better prepared and to avoid strategic surprises. Um, I'll give you a, there's many examples that I could give you, but I will give you one. And that is the example of the, um, the Arab awakening. So if I take you now more than 10 years back in time to 2010, the beginning of uh, 2010, of course, 2010, 2011, where of course throughout the Middle East and North Africa region, you see a, a series of regional mobilization, the popular demonstrations, civil mobilizations calling for increased freedom, protesting authoritarian regimes, calling for an end to, um, calling for more, for more democracy, more freedom, and really um, really what uh, would many have, uh, have, de have described as the Arab awakening. Now in that context, uh, one, of the, one of the examples of countries that had an early on uh, protest movement and civil revolution is of course Syria. And at the time, uh, most, of the, most of the experts that looked at the country were incredibly surprised. And the assessment was until the revolution really began, many, many experts were saying there is no way that a country like Syria would have an internal, um, would have protests, would have civil uh, protests, would have revo a revolution. And that is because looking through a narrow, national security lens, what many experts were saying, and they were right, is that Syria was a very repressive, very authoritarian state uh, with the regime in very strong control of the country and the society. So in that condition, the country was seen as basically immune, if you wish, from unrest and stable, maybe not happy, maybe not democratic, but certainly stable. And what I, what I would like to say is that had we looked at the country through, through a broader lens, through a human security lens, we could actually have said that that facade of stability was really highly problematic for many reasons. One is it is true that the country was very stable when it comes to the control of the regime. But it is also true that from a human security, so from economic, environmental, personal perspective, the country is actually very insecure, unsecure and very unstable. For example, if we looked at indicators like internal equality, so equality, the inequality between people, we would have said, we would have seen that over the, two, the 10 prior years between 2000 and 2010, the level of inequality was rising. The level of uh, difference between rural poverty and urban poverty was rising. Uh, the country had one of the highest youth unemployment in the region, a region itself that has one of the highest youth unemployment rates in the world. Um, if had we looked at the envir environment, we would have seen that just before the revolution, there were a year of drought uh, caused by climate change and leading to profound food insecurity in the region. And then we would have seen that, yes, that the, the, the regime was very authoritarian and the, with the high level of repression, but also a high level of corruption. So it was actually perceived as very... Um, 
problematic and illegitimate by the vast majority of the citizens. In other words, when we started looking at the country through a human security lens, we could have seen that um, that idea of stability was actually very, very problematic. But this is just one example of how by broadening the lens, we can better understand the world around us and we can better assess uh, security risks. But of course, this is not the whole picture. It's not just about being better at understanding. Understanding better is very important, but uh, in the, in, given that, uh, but in policy circles, of course, it's not enough. We also need to have better uh, policies. And I think one key uh, challenge that we have faced over the past decades is the challenge of stability and stabilization. What does it take to, um, to address a context of armed conflict and fragility and to bring stability? And that's something that, it's, that matters to the security of those countries that are unstable, but it also matters to the security of those regions and ultimately also affects global security. So it's something that also affects us directly. And I think one of the lessons that we, sh we need to learn and we are, we are learning from the past decades is that the challenge of stability is far broader than just the military aspect. And this same discussion is very pertinent when we talk about challenge, the challenges related to international terrorism and insurgency. Um, and that's when I think human security can really help us make better policies. Um, I'll stop for a second to say, if you today uh, take open up a look at a map of political violence. So if you look at where in the world you have active conflicts, and then you look at where in the world are the most active uh, terrorist organizations, you can definitely see that there is a convergence. There is a coming together of hotspots for terrorism tend to be located in areas where you have fragile states, so weak states, with high level of human insecurity. This is definitely true, for example, uh, if we look at the Middle East and North Africa and we look at the different um, branches of Al Qaeda, both in Yemen, which is of course an area of active conflict, but of course also in Syria or in Iraq. And of course the rise of ISIS was, was another, is, another, is another case in point. It is also uh, the case when we look at Boko Haram in Nigeria. So we are moving from the Middle East to Africa, but also Al-Shabaab again in Africa in Somalia. And if we move uh, to uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and we look at the Taliban's and ISIS there. The point is the most active, sophisticated and lethal, so the most complex terrorist groups all operate in areas that are fragile and marked by high human insecurity. So conflict, state fragility are key enablers for international terrorism and that's when I'm saying that's when these challenges also affect us directly. Um, what and when I talk about state fragility, what I mean is a high level of human insecurity. I'm basically talking about areas of the world in which the state is unable or unwilling to, um, well, first of all, to ensure basic security for, the, for its citizens, where it can, doesn't hold a monopoly over the use of force, but also where the state is un, unable or unwilling to provide basic political goods and to ensure a basic level of economic security, food security, health security, um, and how the combination between state fragility, so the inability of the state to do what it's supposed to do, um, create, generates opportunities for armed groups, including terrorist organizations, to step in and to fill that void. And that is something that affects not just the security of that country, but also our global security, ultimately. And if that's the case, then I would argue that to tackle that threat, we need to address not just the rise of the group, not just the armed groups, the terrorist organizations themselves, but we also really need to tackle the broader context where they operate. And that's where thinking in human security terms really helps us. 
I'll give you one example, and that is the, the example of uh, the rise of ISIS in Iraq and Syria. And of course, the group is now, as of 2021, has been severely downgraded militarily, but is far from completely gone or absent. But if we want to understand how the group was able to rise in the first place in those areas, we have to really understand the context of human insecurity. In the case of Syria, of course, we have to understand how the group was able to operate in the, in the context of an ongoing civil war characterized by a high level of violence against the civilian population and high level of polarization. In the case of Iraq, uh, similarly, we can see how the group uh, ISIS was able to rise after 2003, again, thriving in the context of insecurity. And then, of course, uh, at the time, ISIS was not called ISIS, it was called Al-Qaeda in Iraq. So it, it went through different stages. But the basic point is that the lack of security, the internal conflict was uh, provided the fertile ground for the group to establish itself and later on uh, internal dynamics of marginalization and exclusion and corruption provided the group with fertile art with strong arguments to try to recruit and build some type of relationship with the civilian population um, and i think with and i think that this insight is not just important to understand why a group like ISIS was able to rise in the first place, but it's just as important when we want to think about how do we deal with stabilization, how do we deal with the challenge of securing those areas after uh, the group has been defeated militarily. And again, the, the point is the military has, has been a necessary tool to downgrade a group like ISIS militarily. So there is a, there is a military part to the solution. However, after the group is downgraded militarily, that's when if we don't look at the other factors, we're not able to have a sustainable security. In other words, um, military campaigns have been able, were able to downgrade ISIS militarily. And that's of course a great victory. But what happens the day after is just as important. And if, on the day, and if our goal is to have stability, and if our goal is to have long-term stability and some type of um, and security for the population leading to a situation of peace, then the military uh, tool alone is not able to obtain that. In order to have that stability, we also need to address development. We also need to care about reconstruction. We have to address uh, political reforms. Uh, we have to think about the broader human security challenges. We have to think about the social uh, divisions and polarization within those communities. And we have to think about how do, how do the communities and individuals uh, how will we need to provide security, personal and community security in the long term? All of these together, all of these interventions, and I'm using the word intervention not to mean that they need to come from abroad, let's say all these policies uh, from the economic development to political reform, to provision of security, to social, to social um, reconciliation, all these policies are just as important to stability as the military and security focus. You know, in other words, if we only focus on the narrow security and military tools, we fail to, um, to address the context, the root causes, the underlying factors that have led to instability in the first place. And that's why the stabilization challenge is such a difficult one to handle. It's one that is long-term. The idea does, the, and the, the idea that countries can uh, be uh, one day in the midst of conflict and the next day into a peace transition. That's just a myth. It doesn't happen. There is no, um, many of our political science books focus on the battles and the war. And then at the end of the chapter, there is a peace agreement. And, and the, the narrative is that 
the parties to the conflict signed the peace agreement and the day after well we then we moved to a different conflict but there in the, in the history books but the reality is that peace doesn't happen in a day it takes many years of time it takes generation rebuilding um destroyed infrastructure uh, reconciling societies after war uh, repairing war wounds at times can take um an enormous amount of effort and an enormous amount of time. So when the crisis stops being in the news and when there is quote unquote a peace, well, that's great, but that's when the real work starts. And that's, that's why a human security perspective is very helpful because it really helps us to think about war and peace, not, just, not in dichotomous terms, but much more as, a part of a process and much more makes us think that to get from war to peace, you really have to have a long, you really have to have a long term investment and trans in ensuring that transition and that by no means can that ever happen quickly, by no means can ever happen overnight, and by no means cannot can that happen without this whole of government integrated comprehensive approach that doesn't just look at the narrow military aspect, but also looks at development, social reconstruction, um, peace building, and uh, all that set of policies. And of course, uh, of course, when it's also very important to think that uh, human security also allows us to think better in terms of who are the protagonists, who are the main was the agency to transition from war to peace. And that is those communities, those civilians, those countries, those societies affected by conflict. And I think it's also very important because especially in the last um, few decades, I think as the international community, we've gone through a steep learning curve. And one of the lessons we're learning is that we can, external actors can support external actors can assist external actors can help but by but external actors cannot drive change change sustainable change and sustainable security will only come from the countries themselves from the societies themselves and that's why by thinking in human security terms we are also really put in the focus on what does community need to have stability and what does it take to help them so in other words it's shifting the lens a little bit and as opposed to thinking about external state building which we know doesn't work uh, it helps us to think a lot more into how can we support local partners local engagement and really put the emphasis where it should be which is on the people that are in those countries uh, and really understand their, the needs of the communities much better than anybody coming from the outside can ever do. So uh, I think policy-wise, this is very important. Um, and I'm, I want to have plenty of time uh, to also have some questions. So I'm going to start closing now, but uh, um, let me summarize a little bit some of the points that I've made in terms of talking about the future of human security. Um, First of all, the future of the concept is up to us. It depends, it depends on us as the uh, policymakers and academics and thinkers to think whether we want to shift from a more narrow, only national security focused lens to a broader human security, more integrated lens through which we should we look at conflict and we look at security challenges and we look at questions of war and peace. Uh, my point would be that broadening the spectrum is first, it's the smart thing to do, because as I tried to explain very briefly today, it does allow us by taking a broader set of challenges by looking at the context, I think we can better understand uh, realities on the ground, and we can be better prepared, and we can better understand where security risks come from. So we can, so it's half of this alpha the picture is that because we would be better at understanding but this, the other side of the coin of course is that if we understand better and we are really willing to engage with a broader set of questions through the human human security lens then ultimately i believe we can get to better policies and that's especially important when we think about challenges related to stability and stabilization 
And that's because I do not think these problems, I do not think these issues are going to go away anytime soon. To the contrary, unfortunately, if we look at the trends in conflict in the last decade, what we do see is that the number of wars around the world, the number of armed conflicts are not declining. And the average length of this conflict is actually increasing. So if I look at the future, I, I think we need to be prepared to deal with a reality in which we will have more unpredictability, longer, 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 well, in political science term, we call them protracted political crisis, so longer conflicts. And then another, um, another trend that I think we will deal with is that we will deal with more, with more situations of uh, no war, no peace, meaning areas where there is no active war, but there is no peace either. It's sort of this in-between hybrid limbo where there is no open war, but there's also no stability. And, uh, and to deal with this type of permanent emergencies, if you will, we really need to, uh, to look at the security challenges through a broader lens. And again, human security can really help us. Um, so that's a little bit my take today. It's a, the concept itself. I think it's important, but what is even more important is to is to recognize that um, the the military and the security tools are just are necessary but not sufficient component of our toolkit when it when it comes to ensuring stability and longer term peace. Um, and I think that's that's a lesson of the past two decades. It's a lesson that should shape the way we approach fragility and instability around the world. And it's also a, an important challenge where we discuss what it means and what should be our security agenda and our security priorities in our own societies and countries. And I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Birdie. Um, this certainly does seem like a much more productive way to think about security. Um, so it's really got uh, my wheels turning. Um, anybody in the audience uh, has any questions for Dr. Birdie, please go ahead and put those into the Q&A now and I'll uh, go ahead and, and read those as they come available. Uh, but I thought I would sort of kick things off here with a, a question because I was, uh, I was very interested in your argument that, uh, you know, a state like Syria uh, is maybe very good at providing traditional security in terms of um, stability, uh, but, uh, but that neglect of the human security element, um, not only uh, maybe the source of conflict, but it might actually be a, a, a good predictor uh, that, that those sort of conflicts are going to occur and that maybe if we had paid more attention to that in 2010 or so, um, then what happened in Syria might not have been as much of a surprise. Um, I'm just curious to get your take uh, looking forward um, with that framework in mind. Uh, you know, Syria itself seems to have kind of reached some relative equilibrium now. Um, even Iraq, you know, to some extent, uh, the, the, the level of, I, I, I guess, I think of both of those countries as sort of entering this no peace, no war situation uh, that, that you spoke about. I'd just be curious, especially since you are an expert in uh, Middle Eastern politics and Middle Eastern conflicts in particular, um, looking around the region, do you see uh, warning signs, uh, in other words, a place that we should be focusing our attention on? Thank you. No, that's, that's a really good question. Um, so first of all, I would agree with you that uh, at this point, uh, when I look at, uh, I think when I think about the future of a country like Syria, it's very difficult to, to, to imagine a um, clear path towards stability or towards the uh, transition towards the peace building mode. And I, 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 unfortunately, I think, because this is one of the, I think, greatest tragedies that we've really seen unfolding over the past over 10 years, which is, uh, which is really a, by itself a horrific 
piece of statistics that this conflict has been raging more or less for 10 years now. But as you, as you point out, it is now, uh, if you wish, transitioning into a situation where the active hostilities um, are declining. Um, and eventually, we'll, I, I, I'm foresee, I'm, I'm speculating, of course, but eventually we'll, we will get into this no war, no peace type of scenario. And, and, and the problem, I would say, is that in my mind, um, that that situation will, will is, it's difficult to foresee how that situation is going to, to um, to lead to a to a real uh, transition toward peace, unless the underlying factors that led to the conflict in the first place are addressed, and unfortunately, I don't see that happening because the country remains uh, remains ruled by a heavily uh, authoritarian state. Um, there is a heavily polarized society. Of course, there has been uh, there have been a civilian population that has been brutalized and traumatized over 10 years of conflict. And uh, the signs that um, that we could shift from a situation from a war to peace are very, very, uh, very, very slim. So I'm unfortunately uh, putting in my mind that country as one that might have authoritarian stability, as you as you rightly say, but definitely not uh, human security and definitely very little um, stability of itself. I think or, throughout the region, there are diff there are other conflicts that, of course, also deserve our full attention and that are also likely candidates for, unfortunately, for long term protracted instability. Yemen is, of course, another one. The situation in Libya uh, shifting to North Africa is another. Um, the entire Sahel region, um, Mali, Niger uh, is also uh, very much in in this uh, in this similar context of prolonged instability, where it's very difficult to foresee a path uh, for for a positive transition. Um, and then, in terms of just to, just to close on the warning signs, um, I think warning signs are are many if we want to look for them. The warning signs don't necessarily mean that a country is going to go is going to get into a full state of war, but I think it's it's I think it's important to to look at them anyway, nevertheless. And to me, some of the warning sign of instabilities that are still very much in the region are well, one of them I mentioned is the high level of un youth unemployment. That is something that I think it's quite it's quite important to keep in mind. And uh, the Middle East and North Africa, as after Sub-Saharan Africa, the highest percentage of the population being under 24 years of age. So of course, youth is a big part of the population, but it's also the region in the world with the highest level of youth unemployment. That's normally not something that, when to me, that's one of the indicators that is always very interesting in terms of um, Flag, flag, red flags for stability, of course, but others are much more uh, grounded in social and political dynamics. For example, and, and I'll stop here, but I think it's something that we 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 still need to fully comprehend. Uh, it's uh, of course the Syria, uh, one of the tragic byproducts of the Syrian civil war has been the millions of refugees that have had to leave their country to seek shelter elsewhere. The majority of the of Syrian, the majority of refugees from Syria, has sought shelter in its neighbor, in neighboring countries, in Lebanon, in Jordan, and in Turkey. Um, the challenges, the long term challenges for those countries that have had influx of millions. Uh, are not, I, I think, something that we haven't fully grasped. Imagine uh, at a certain point in the, in the Syrian civil war, the number of uh, Syrian refugees in Lebanon was one to three. So that means for each three, three citizens, one was a refugee. Um, that is, the problem is not, of course, there's nothing, of, the challenge here is, was a challenge of how do you uh, provide education to everyone? How do you provide shelter to everyone? How do you provide um, schooling and 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 the very important basic needs that 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 the new the new uh, arrival the, the refugees needed? In other words, there's a number of social and political challenges related to these conflicts that sometimes we tend to forget, but those are really long term. Uh, in a context like Syria, like where most people are not able to go back home because the war is raging. 
um, then the challenge of what happens to those millions of people that are far from their home, don't have full rights, are not able to fully integrate, what does this do to that society? So there's, I'll stop here, but uh, the point I'm making is that uh, we really need to think of the consequence of conflict in a very broad way. Thank you. A uh, question from the audience. How do international policymakers go about trying to address human security issues without infringing on the sovereignty of other states, especially in cases where the government itself is part of the problem? That is a very, that is a very, very good question. So, um, so I, I will give first a more a more official answer in terms of the organization I work for, and then I'll move more to the academic bit. Um, so fr from a perspective of where I'm working now on NATO, uh, the, the work we do when it comes to support and stability is working with the countries in the region. So for example, um, from, from, so for example, we have uh, training and capacity building work in, in the Middle East and North Africa with uh, many of the regional countries from Jordan to Morocco to Iraq to Tunisia. But here the key word is the partnership. So it is a, it is a bi, it's very much a bilateral relationship. Those countries come uh, and say, we have these security problems. These security problems have to do with uh, proliferation of small arms and light weapons. So weapon smuggling, which is unfortunately a very big problem in the region, uh, international terrorism, crime. And those, of course, are problems for those countries, but they're also problems that affect their whole region. And they also have a direct impact on our security. So there we have a shared interest. They have an interest in fighting, in fighting, for example, uh, Iraq has a clear interest in fighting ISIS. We have a clear interest in making sure that ISIS is, is vanquished because he has also clear security implications for us. So we work together. So what we can do, we can do training, capacity building. So it is very much, um, it is very much not an imposition on the sovereignty. It is very much working together, driven by the fact that we have common challenges. And that's very much the case when it comes to fighting international terrorism. We have, uh, we have a key, uh, we, we have a key shared interest. So in that sense, it's a much, it's clear, it's a, it's a win-win situation and it's an easy one. Um, now stepping outside to the work I do every day, more from a, from a, so more from a, an academic perspective, there is no clear, there is, uh, it's difficult to answer in a few minutes, but it is one of the key questions, right, in, in, international, in international security and international politics. Uh, what is the right balance, what is the balance between national sovereignty uh, responsibility to protect and uh, and 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 the an international an international community responsibility to keep international peace and security. Uh, it is not. Uh, I mean, I'm looking at the time because I need hours to to, to get into the question. But I think it's. I think. I think. First of all, uh, it is an open question, but. Uh, I'll phrase it through a question because I think for the time I cannot do more, but the question is, are there times where um, a state by showing plain disregard for international law and by uh, brutalizing its own citizens, uh, de, facto, de facto its sovereignty starts to become something that you can um, put a question mark, the, 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 the right to sovereignty and to, um, to lack of intervention, it's something that you can start to question. The, the, the point is in, the, in our international system, we have methods to do that and it is through the United Nations Security Council, um, of course, uh, meaning that when, when, uh, when, they, when, when states came together to create the United Nations, they did, they, did, they did foresee that there would be circumstances under which a state by committing grave crimes like genocide, war crimes, war crimes against humanity by actively um, going against its own population, like, for, like we've seen unfortunately many cases in history, would be, uh, would be de facto um, 
lose some of its rights and uh, the international community will be able to come together and decide that what this state is doing is a breach to international peace and security and then a chapter seven resolution and on that basis the united nations security council would authorize um means to stop that from happening and those means don't necessarily have to be military it can be sanctions it can be diplomacy but the fact is the international community has come together and agreed that the yes yeah, states are sovereign but that does not mean that they have a right to do everything a state as a, a, you can be a sovereign state but you have no right to commit genocide and if you're doing that well you are forfeiting that right and the international community can come together and decide to take measures to stop you. Uh, but that's that's a clear case. In other cases, it's much more nuanced and gray area. And that's, of course, a, an, ongoing an ongoing political discussion. It's probably a good segue into our next question, too, which is a uh, sort of international relations theory question. Um, the audience member asked, what type of international relations regime for example, realist, liberalist, et cetera, um, do you think offers the best approach to addressing human security issues? <laughs> That's such a great question. Um, I've never thought about it. Uh, I want to say, and this is counterintuitive, but I want to say that, um, so intuitively you would say a realist prism would be the least uh, in line with human security, right? Because of course, realism, Lucas says, at state interest and state behavior puts the state as the main actors in the international arena. So you would say, well, human security may be a little bit more in the fluffy, in the fluffy department and realists do not think about human security. And that's largely true, but I would argue that to me, the case I'm trying to make is that it is actually in very much in our state interest to look at this, to take a human security um, approach because it would actually allow us to take better decisions uh, to avoid costly long-term engagements that at the end of the day don't lead us to where we want to be politically. So I would, uh, a little bit to go against um, against what could should be the expected answer, I would say actually I think that it's a very, that it is entirely right in line with realism to say, uh, to say yes, states are the main actors, but when and and states should behave according to their interests, and that's what motivates states. I actually do believe that, but I think it is in our interest to look at security in a broader sense because that way we will use our scarce resources better, and we will use our military where the military is needed, and there is absolutely a role, and it's very very important. But we'll also use other tools when those tools are better suited. So I actually think that you can reconcile realism and this kind of broader way of looking at security, um, which is maybe a little counterintuitive. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, so uh, the audience member says, great lecture, Dr. Birdie. Uh, can you explain how tribalism has influenced instability and insecurity in the Middle East, North Africa and Sahel region and what has been done to combat tribal disputes. Wow, this is, uh, so first of all, thank you for, for, for saying, for, for having enjoyed the lecture. That's very good to hear. And also thanks to all, to all these questions because they're really good, um, which means they're hard. Um, so I think this is a very good question because you can approach it through very different lenses. One thing I would say um, is that and this is again maybe a little counterintuitive. One of the biases that we have had in the last decades in thinking about stabilization and peace building is that, and it's understandable because a lot of this comes, a lot of the stabilization and peace building actors are come from North America and Europe. So we look at the way our states work. And we look at other societies and oftentimes the bias is well what works well here may work well there which sometimes works but you will not be surprised to hear sometimes it's really a bad idea and this also applies to uh, to I'll, I'll get to the tribes i promise but that's that's also applies to oftentimes thinking about development and stabilization through a state-based prism and and saying well if a country is a little it's fragile 
and we want it to be more stable, the best thing we can do is to really build up the state. You know, pump resources into the state, then this, you know, build a stronger ministry of development, uh, help, uh, help, uh, help pump up the state resources. And ultimately, that's going to be a great idea because the state is going to function better, it's going to make sure it's going to be able to rule uh, over the whole country, administer services, and do all the things that the state needs to do. And if you look at it that way, then everything that is not the state is, is a problem. So then the fact that the societies are organized in ways that are not state-based through tribes, clans, extended family, community structures, all of that is like, well, that doesn't really fit well in a neat, in a, in a state-based design. And so, so, and so that has been our lens in many conflicts. And we've gone there and we said, you know, let's, let's invest in the state. Let's sort of try to, uh, convince everyone else to work through the state and then and eventually we'll have stability and sometimes that works but most of the times it doesn't because because we end up neglecting local base of governance that have been there for a really long time and maybe they need help maybe they need reform maybe they need to be helped but they function and tribal structures are one of this are one of the are one of these meaning that Yes, dispute between tribes can be a problem. And of course, encouraging less and working on resolution of those is very important. But I would urge us not to think about the fact that there are alternative structures to the state as always a problem. It doesn't have to be necessarily a problem. Sometimes those local community-based traditional authority systems of governance actually functions quite well. And they become a problem when we start when we try to say well from tomorrow you need to work through the state because they've never done so um so not to say that not to say that uh, that necessarily that is necessarily uh, these structures are good but also to say that sometimes we've had a bias and we've looked at all this like all this alternative form of governance as a problem and i don't think that's and i think sometimes actually we have to think about that as a potential solution um, because they are more rooted in the local community, they are they have historical ties, and and sometimes they can really um, deliver uh, when it comes to development or stabilization. Of course, there of course it's not nothing is easy. So there's always a trade off between build between working through the states because if and because if you choose to work through actors that are not the state you risk weakening the state so it's not an easy choice um so i'm not i'm not pretending it is but i'm saying that sometimes uh just getting rid of the assumption that what that our model of political governance is the only effective one would already help us a lot and i think that uh, yeah that would be my answer well, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Murdy, and a fascinating talk. And uh, thank you to everybody in attendance. We hope you've enjoyed the program uh, and we hope you'll join us for future events. Um, we'll be putting out information soon on the uh, Global Decision Series for next year, which will be kicking off in the fall. So keep an eye out for that. And uh, as usual, you can always find out uh, what we're doing, activities, events, things that our students are doing by going to our website or following us on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Uh, so one more time, just like to uh, express our appreciation, Dr. Birdie, for um, a great talk. And thank you again to everybody for being here. Hope you all have a nice uh, rest of the week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.